Hello, and welcome to the PC Security Channel. This is the third episode of Security Talk with our guest, Hussain, from My IT Tech. Hi, uh, as Rahit said, I run My IT Tech. I'm a fairly small YouTube channel that mainly focuses on antivirus reviews as well as some other Mac app spotlights. Um, and that's essentially what I focus on, and from time to time I'll um, d- delve into other topics, but fairly limited. Okay. So you're going to be discussing some of these security topics with us. So let's let's go ahead and start with the first one that is related to Macs. And you're a Mac user. I'm a partial Mac user, so we both know <laughs> how it is to be targeted. So mm-hmm. fake tech support scam targets Macs. Now, you've probably heard of a lot of these tech support scams on Windows, but have you ever heard of one on Mac? I mean, they usually... When, when those scammers, they call people with Macs, they're frustrated because they don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, a, a lot of the whole cold calling usually does happen with Windows, and then as soon as you tell them that you have uh, a Mac, they'll usually hang up or they say that they can't help you. But now with this whole targeting of Mac users, it, it I think it provides a new dynamic to the whole issue, where Mac users typically aren't used to seeing these, kind of, these kinds of notices. Yes, yeah, so they're more vulnerable. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, what they typically do is, is they kind of give you a weird message on a website or they try to lock your browser. And that is what causes people to panic and think that there is really something wrong. In case of Windows, I know um, a fair bunch of these scammers, typically what they do is they kind of call you and then they tell you to go to Event Viewer and they say that all the errors or problems notified over there, those are all malware. So you're infected by malware, we're from Windows, we're going to clean your PC. But this is clearly a different tactic, but this has to do with Macs. But th- this has become a menace now. I mean, it's it's bad to see that they're getting enough encouragement that they've started their business with Macs now. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm just curious what what they might show to users other than just locking their browser. On what, what how would they convince a Mac user that they that they have an issue? Would they open up a console on OS 10 and show some of the warnings and errors there? Because those are fairly typical, and I assume it's the same for Event Viewer on Windows. Yes, so I think that it, that is what they can do. I mean, Macs are not as vulnerable to problems as Windows. Okay, please, no hate here. We're just talking on (laughs) neutral grounds. I do not want to turn this into a Mac versus PC debate, but uh, I use both of them, by the way. (laughs) But um, yeah, the the point is, you know, there's not as much malware for Mac right now as there is for Windows, and and it's kind of slightly different. We don't get as many vSOTs and stuff on Mac, but uh, I assume that these scammers are able to convince people that uh, something's wrong with their Mac. I, I don't know what they tell them. Do they tell them that they have malware or do they tell them that uh, your Mac has some manufacturing problem or I, I don't even know what they use as incentive for people to pay them but while well, they're being successful and they're do- running a large scale, uh, scale campaign so that is definitely an issue. And I'm sure it would have been very interesting if we could actually just listen, listen in on one of those calls just yeah. to hear what, what, what they would say. Um, And and I think as Macs become more prevalent and as a lot of people or some people do switch from Windows to OS X, that they might think that uh, OS X has all these issues that they're they're used to on Windows, but they're handled differently on on a Mac than they are. Yes, some people just don't want to give up their business. I mean, Windows, Mac, you name it, you might even see them on Linux someday. Let's move Mm -hmm. right along. So the next topic we have is the ransomware locker. And this was a really weird ransomware event because the author of this ransomware or the creator or the cyber criminal, whatever language you want to use, actually after setting the malware up and, you know, getting it in the works and starting to earn money from it, he actually discarded it. And he went back, he wrote a public apology on Pastebin, and he actually decrypted all the users for free. How often do you see that? That was very strange, in my opinion. Maybe had a bit of a moral dilemma, and just maybe just felt bad or felt like it wasn't right. But it's it's incredibly rare, if at all, to see uh, someone who created malware to go ahead and um, give out the encryption keys, especially for uh, this kind of um, ransomware. 
yes that that is definitely weird and uh, something else to note here is that it's it's not necessarily that he was struck by conscience like most people think it's also possible you know there's so many possible explanations he, he could have been caught in his own trap he may have bitten off more than he can chew like for example it, he might have realized that his command and control servers are not secure and somebody might he might be discovered or caught and might end up facing legal action or something like that and that might have cost him to do this but we don't know exactly what happened in his mind over there but this was a typical ransomware payment and bitcoin demanded payment goes 10 times if you don't pay it within 72 hours now did he threaten to delete files if they still didn't pay after the 72 hours or um or uh, i guess not delete the files but delete the encryption key or um yes uh, probably i mean that's that's how ransomware works i mean they, they can't keep all the encryption keys forever right i mean they're gonna run out of space in their server so they have to delete it at some point i don't think he specified the time but I guess once the payment is doubled, there must be some more time, like three days, after which you, you don't have any chance of getting your data back. This does remind me of this uh, other uh, ransomware style of uh, malware, where I believe the malware creator um, did also demand payment in Bitcoin, but there was this elderly woman who wasn't familiar with Bitcoin, mm -hmm. and then he later decrypted her files, or I think he didn't increase the payment uh, just because he felt bad. Okay, so so that's a unique example as well. So it seems cyber criminals have some heart. <laughs> and and look at this message. Uh, I'm sorry about the encryption. Your files are unlocked for free. Be good to the world and don't forget to smile. All right, interesting incident, but you know it's it's ransomware is a major threat these days, and some popular ransomware variants end up earning over. 2000 US dollars. That's a lot of money and it's a very profitable business. Mm -hmm. And especially if you consider just how many antivirus products and anti malware products aren't well equipped to handle ransomware. Um, and I, I won't name names, but I can think of a couple just off the top of my head where they don't recognize ransomware that well or that accurately. Yes. And, uh, you know, people, if you want to be safe from ransomware, the best way to do it is to have backup of all your important data. Don't let the crooks keep your data as hostage and demand payment. I mean, don't make your data that valuable to you. Keep several copies of it. You can keep it in a cloud drive or you can keep it in an external drive. But don't just, if it's that important to you, make sure you have more than one copy of that data. And if it is on an external drive, just make sure you unplug it from time to time because some ransomware can actually access that external hard drive as well. Yes. So let's move on to the next topic. This is very interesting. Gone in 10 seconds. So you ever used any of these garage doors that can be unlocked with a remote? Uh, I think I used to have one at uh, the old house. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so... What we don't realize is as we get, keep getting better at technology and we have more and more of our physical life um, using technology, we also have to up the security. I mean, some of these use age-old security techniques. Like, for example, in this case, this garage door, it uses 12-bit codes that are transmitted in order to detect whether or not it's the owner and whether or not to unlock. Now, 12-bit codes are not at all secure. I mean, they're... The total number of possible combinations here is 4096, just that much, 4,000 combinations. I mean, I can imagine even a cell phone, any kind of power device in these days, will be able to just blast through this thing with brute force. And especially if you can just consider how much more powerful these computers in our hands, these cell phones that we all yes. have access to are, and just how weak a 12-bit uh, key is and especially if you're uh, sending it wirelessly yes that is a major issue you can just pick up um, you know any signal transmitter and uh, once you crack the code you can open the door and pretty much get access to the house so as secure as it may seem it may not be although it, it can't be broken with physical force it's it's not so difficult to brute force it through a powerful computer and nowadays the power that is available with cell phones it's it's not at all impractical 
And it, it's just a little bit surprising to me, the, the toy that he decided to use in this experiment. Oh, I mean, sesame? <laughs> oh, okay. Choosing a children's toy just seems surprising. I thought maybe go with a cell phone to prove that <laughs> how prevalent it would have been, but... Yes. Well, he, he made a joke out of it, literally. I, I guess that's fair. <laughs> okay, so let's move on. So phishing, I mean, this is something that everyone is affected by regardless of operating system, regardless of your the products you use, whatever you do, you can't avoid phishing. And um, this unique report suggests that more than 54% of phishing attacks target three brands, Apple, PayPal, and uh, a Chinese marketplace that's Taobao. I mean, I'm not familiar with the last one, but I can tell you Apple and PayPal, I've seen a lot of those phishing websites, fake websites pretending to be Apple and PayPal. Yeah. Most of the ones I've seen start with an email asking you to update your password or that um, your account has been locked. Uh, with Apple, it's mainly an iTunes related one. With PayPal, we'll start with Dear PayPal Member. Mm -hmm. And generally, if it's from one of those two companies, it should start with your first name or the name they have on file for you. Yes. So, I mean, the phishing is actually not uh, very easy to defend from. Like, let's say uh, you have anti-malware. You can block malicious applications. But how do you stop phishing? The, the only way to do that is, I guess, to blacklist each and every single website that does this thing. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's much better rather than relying on any kind of protection is to use your brain. Like, you know how we can pre prevent phishing just by looking at the web address. I mean, it's as simple as that. Just Just read the website. Just read the address bar at the top and especially make sure that the website you're checking has a license or a certificate. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think some sites are, are trying to keep up with and blacklist all these phishing sites. I think it was the fish tank, I believe. Yes. Uh, that, that's been working on that. And um, I believe it does integrate with a couple browser uh, plugins or extensions that you can use. But I mean, even still, mm -hmm. there's nothing better than just quickly checking. And then even if you do click a link in an email, Maybe you just uh, go directly to the URL instead of uh, following that link. Yeah, so now, now there's two kinds of you know phishing attacks. One of them are like they hijack the website and use it temporarily for phishing purposes. Or some, some websites are just created to do phishing. You know, in the latter case, you can obviously avoid them just by looking at the address. But, you know, some cases are more difficult than that. So I, I think... Common sense is, is the tool that is most handy in these cases. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think because of just how prevalent, uh, jumping into the later part of the article, at how prevalent WordPress is and how, yes. uh, um, I guess, self-installs of WordPress are, um, it can be incredibly easy. And I guess it gives um, hackers, I, 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 I usually don't like using that word, but hackers in general, it gives them a lot of choices in terms of which website they want to target. Yes. All right, so, you know, for phishing, common sense is the best remedy. I mean, just, just look at the address bar. Just look at the website. Does it look fake to you? Does it look legitimate to you? That usually gives it away. You know, for other cases, there's always web blocking and web prevention that most, most decent anti-malware products come with. Let's move on to the next topic. So this is about another... POS malware. I know we covered uh, a previous POS malware before, but this is a new one, Malum POS. Essentially what happens with um, this specific point of sale malware is generally if there is a point of sale system, so be it, gen just to generalize it, a cash register in a store, in a retail store, um, and if it's connected to a network or has some sort of port, then it, in the simplest terms, it can be infected with uh, this malware. And what then it what it can then do is uh, take credit card and customer data, and then that can either be sold uh, on the black market to um, to other people with malicious intent, or it can then be used by the hacker uh, to uh, charge that card or to run up credit card limits. Yes. So, I mean, this is something that the customer has no way of preventing. That is something that worries me. And what motivation do the storekeepers have to protect their system? So this is a very important 
aspect. I mean, that probably we should think about a lot. I guess this malware was discovered by Trend Micro. And uh, the most important part is we need to have some kind of motivation for the store keepers or whoever managed those systems to keep their machines secure because it's so important. I mean, just think about the number of people that are swiping their credit cards and debit cards away in those stores. If you if you have an infected system, look at the potential. How many, how much data can be actually stolen? I mean, it's unlike anything we've ever seen. I mean, be it phishing, every single customer has to enter their da their data for it to get stolen. But in this case, all you have to do is infect one of those machines, and once that is done, and once you can scrape the RAM or whatever, uh, you get access to all these different credit cards and the users won't even know what went wrong or, or why their credit card details were compromised mm -hmm. and is actually uh, you talked about motivation for i guess the storekeepers or the yes. merchants to protect their systems would you suggest uh, i guess a proactive approach or more of like a penalty if something goes wrong yes i think there needs to be a bit of both there needs to be a proactive approach and the fact that they need to do regular checkups and they need to make sure that you do have some protection on those systems. You know, systems that do not have some level of protection should not be allowed to, you know, just be used for these purposes. And there, there needs to be some kind of penalty or some kind of co compensation that they need to pay the users in case something goes wrong. because. You know, this is something like even let's say I'm a security expert and I, I keep my computer very secure and I go to a store and I swipe my credit card. There is absolutely nothing I can do at that position to save myself from this kind of malware apart from just not using my credit card at all, which is definitely not a solution. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess another uh, issue would be that I guess merchants might just not be educated on the whole yes. that, that they might not know that malware can affect their POS systems and yes. can actually steal customer data. Yes, education is the key. That's why we say stay informed, stay secure. All right, so um, let's move on to some of the technicalities of this malware, like Malum POS. What's interesting about it is it disguises itself as an NVIDIA display driver. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's trying to build up trust with uh, whoever's operating that system yes, and, at the time. Yes, and the thing is, you don't find something weird. I mean, a normal user, of course, we'd be able to recognize the actual driver service and the name, and we could find the location and know that, okay, this is not actually NVIDIA. But for a normal user, even if they do spot something running in the processes that's NVIDIA display driver, you can bet on the fact that they're not going to end it because they'll think it's the display driver important uh, for their display to function, and they're they're obviously not going to terminate that. Right. So it, it almost forces them to just leave it running, e even if yes. they think something might be suspicious. They yes. they feel as if if they were to end that process, then something could go catastrophically wrong, even yes. when it wouldn't. Yes, that that is the point here. I mean, it's it's a good disguise and. It's a particularly lethal band of malware, I say. Of course, at the moment, these are not so prevalent like other threats like ransomware phishing and things like that. But as we head into the future, I, I can bet that a lot of cyber criminals are going to target POS systems. So I guess until merchants do take charge of their POS systems and do decide to start securing them, the best thing you might be able to do is check your credit card statements often? Yes. Always keep a track of your payments. Don't just forget about it. Don't just use it and forget about it. Keep regular checks of your credit card. And if you see something wrong, contact the bank. Yes, always contact them right away. All right, so I guess that'll be it for this episode of Security Talk. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed it. Um, Hussein, you want to say something? Uh, thank you so much for having me this week, and um, I really enjoy this segment, uh, and I look forward to being here again. Okay. So that's it, people. Let us know how you thought about this episode. Give us your feedback. We like hearing from you. And as always, stay informed, stay secure.